I found this article, uh, and, and so I want to I share this with you. This may help you to understand what has happened to these men that John calls the enemies of Jesus, the Pharisees. There was an article written in 1995 in the Inter International Defense Review, and it was a report on China that they had developed a laser. And the um, writer who posted this article in the Chicago tri uh, Tribune says that they developed a laser beam weapon that can damage the eyes of their enemies. It's a weapon called ZM-87, and it's a portable, what they call portable laser disturber. And the weapon causes injury or dizziness to the uh, soldier who is either sighting in or shooting a weapon of some sort. And what happens is this weapon has a range of about two miles, and it will render the enemy or the soldier who is trying to sight or fire a rifle, Ender, it will render them unable to see. It blinds them, literally cause them to be what they called combat suppressed. They can't fight. They cannot focus. They are not stable. I think that's exactly what John is saying about these Pharisees. Something has entered into the eyelid. Something has entered the brain. Something has transpired and caused them to be combat suppressed. They can no longer fight for God. And I got news for you. That's exactly what Satan does. You come born into this world, combat suppressed, spiritually darkened, clothed off from the things of God, hindered from recognizing the things of God. But part of what I like about taking my time through a text is that you learn things along the way. John says in verse 18 of chapter 9, the Jews therefore did not believe it of him. They didn't believe what he said in verse 17, that Jesus was a prophet. They have got their minds already made up. This is no prophet. This is a sinner in their point of view. And so they didn't believe him. And they decide they not only don't believe the things that he said, they don't believe that he was born blind. They are now going to fabricate a completely new narrative. You didn't, you weren't born blind. Where's your father? Where's your mother? Verse 18 says they wanted to call the parents of the very person who says he received his sight. I want to talk to your mom. I want to talk to your dad. And what I'm after this morning, what I'm hoping you will be able to see, see so very clearly, is simply this. Even though they deny the miracle, they, they have created for the reader and the audience a path of development. You don't notice this when you are going through trials. You don't often pick it up when you are in, quote, unquote, trouble. All you know is things don't feel good. It's not, it's not comfortable. I'm in a difficult situation. I would rather not be. But what happens with this particular individual, the opposition that raises up against him because of the miracle that Jesus performed provides a path of spiritual development for those that get the message. I want you to see this path before we go any further. I want you to see it. This is the, this is the trail I think the blind man cut. He focused on Jesus, not his situation. He'd long given up. Listen, I'm blind. There's nothing I can do about that. That's my life. But one day Jesus comes along, and now he gives him his sight. And I got more trouble now than I think I had when I was blind. But I'm not going to focus on this situation. All I know, a man by the name of Jesus stopped by, and he healed me. He focused on Jesus. He's cutting a path, you guys. This is a path you can walk in your life. This man focused on what Jesus said and drowned out the voices of the others who were hypercritical of him, 
who were con concerned about his identity, concerned about his past, concerned about his present. He drowned that stuff out. He just simply told him, I was blind, but now I can see. Y'all can say what you want to say. I can see now. He didn't focus on what people said. He focused on the voice and the words of Jesus. And that's a direction for you and I. Listen, here's the thing. He focused on what Jesus did. Sometimes, sometimes we get caught up in the things of life and we forget what God has done for us. You can, you can live a thank you life when you are focused on who he is, what he's done, and it's not worrying about what people think, but stay focused on him. Here's something that the Pharisees did not possess. This man listened to Jesus, understood exactly what he said, and acted on it. He listened, he understood, he applied it, stood on that. That is a pathway for your spiritual growth, for our spiritual development. If we will listen to Jesus, focus on him, remember what he's done, and not pay attention to the circumstances around us, that is a pathway because here, here's the golden nugget of truth. What anybody knows is only that which God has revealed. And if you've got what God has offered, I, I got news for you. You got enough. You, you've got enough. So here's some things I want you to leave with. And I'm, I'm flipping it today. I'm, in case I lose somebody's attention at the end, I got too long-winded. I'm going to tell you what I want to tell you now before I get to a place where you won't hear me. <laughs> so I want, I want you to walk away with this. Here, here's some things that. I want you to walk away knowing for certain that I know these things. In, in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul wrote it like this. Here's some things you need to know. For this reason, it's chapter 1, verse 12, 2 Timothy 1, 12. For this reason, I also suffer these things. But I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard that. What I have entrusted to him until that day. If you know who you have put your faith in, no matter what's transpiring in your life, if you have the confidence that that which you have entrusted to him, he will see it through, you have no reason to stay up all night worrying. Don't, don't lose sleep when you learn how to pray. Don't lose sleep. Know who you've trusted. Be confident in Christ. Romans 8 and 28 says, and we know that God, listen carefully. Paul says, we know that God causes all things to work together for the good. To those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. If he causes all things to work together for the good, the difficult in your, stuff in your life is not your problem. If you've entrusted yourself to him, it's his problem. Man, I need, I need to say that again. I might need to hear that for myself, Jim. Yeah. Don't need us worrying and being afraid. Job, the Old Testament prophet Job, put it like this in chapter 19, verse 25. And as for me, these are things you have to know. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. Can't speak for anybody else. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. One day, he promised to return. One day, he's coming. And I'm confident. No matter how difficult things are, no matter what's going on, no matter who says what, one final passage I want to encourage you with, and I ask you to know these things. Hold on to them. Know these things. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we've passed out of death into life. You have to be confident. You can't just show up to church week after week or whenever you come and just feel like, you know, I think I'm going to heaven. 
There has to be certainty in terms of the things that God has offered. And for those who know the truth, that was the concrete promise of Christ. John said it like this. So he's not writing the gospel now. He's writing a letter and he's telling people, we know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. God put his love in our heart and it flows from him to us and from us to others. His love doesn't abide in death. It fosters life. So John says, I know these things. I'm confident about these things. So John 9, 19 goes like this. And they question him, saying, is this your son talking about the parents? Who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know. This is the stuff. It's the stuff you got to know. And we know that this is our son. I, I was pregnant with him for nine months. That's my boy. He's a grown man, she's going to tell him, but that's my son. And we know that he was born blind. Verse 21, but how he now sees, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Here's an op option. Ask him. You guys already know they've already been talking to him, but pops or mom, Grammy, whoever it was, flipped it back and said, a ask him. He's a grown man. He can speak for himself. There's a lot of stuff going on in these verses. They're putting pressure on the family now. They have determined we're going to fix this and we are going to trap them. We are going to break them. We're going to weaken them and we're going to dispel this myth that Jesus healed this man that was born blind. We're going to cause people to think something negative about him and we're going to destroy the credibility of what has transpired. Here's what the parents say. Their answer basically is fourfold. He's our son. The summary of verse 20, he's our son. And yes, yes, he was born blind. And then something happens in verse 21, and I, I, I want to point it out to you. They say, they say, listen, we don't know. We don't know how he's come to see. Here's my thoughts. Mom and dad lied. Somebody take lies off the floor. Look up at me. His parents lied. Oh, I need help this morning, Mary Jane. Pray with me. Pray with me, Mary Jane. They lied. They told these men that they didn't know how he came to see. I guarantee you when he walked through that door and he came through there and saw his mom and dad for the first time in his life, if he couldn't tell him anything else, I am not blind anymore. There's a man by the name of Jesus that healed me. He rubbed some dirt and saliva on my eyes, sent me down to the pool. I went, I washed, I was blind, but now I see. I guarantee you he told him. I don't know who's talking, mom or dad. It's almost like you showing up at somebody's house asking them, you know, what they were doing. They tell these men they don't know who performed the miracle, but they simply say he's grown. You can re-talk it over with him. And I know they lied because they said, we don't know who. You don't, you don't even imply the personal pronoun who if, if there wasn't another person involved. Somebody else was involved. And they knew. But I want to tell you why they lied, and I think you need to catch this. All this is, to me, relevant to all of our lives. They lied because they were scared. They were terrified. They were afraid. And we've been talking about this. If the Pharisees in John's eyes have been identified as enemies of Jesus, and they are utilizing the authority of their positions 
both as political leaders and religious leaders, and they are prepared to bring pressure to bear on the lives of the parents of this man to get them to say what they want them to say? This is a gross misuse of their responsibility and the calling of God. If they will will pressure someone into saying what they want them to say, do what they want them to do because they want to accomplish their own purposes, not truth, not righteousness, then I tell you, there's something wrong at the core of the leadership of the Pharisees and the spiritual leaders there, and that is often and always the core problem. If the spiritual leaders are corrupt, you're going to have political leaders corrupt. If you got, if you got spiritual leaders who cannot speak what we call, we call it this, we call it thus saith the Lord. If, if preachers or spiritual leaders cannot discern and speak openly, clearly, and accurately, thus saith the Lord, they are going to give you their opinion. And all of us are going to go astray. We're going to go astray. And they'll justify sin to accomplish their own goal. The parents were terrified because these men were going to use their positions to destroy the credibility of Jesus In two areas, he told them, listen, I am the light of the world. And I am here to bring light into darkness. And the blind man becomes an illustration. He was born blind, but by the hand of God, now he can see the light of the world has brought light on this situation. And they want to deny both. They want to deny Jesus. They want to deny the miracle. Well, here's a problem. They're telling anyone in the community, if you acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, we're going to put you out the church. I use that symbolically. They put them out the synagogue. They put them out of the temple. They're going to kick them out. You're going to do what I tell you? Even if what I'm telling you is wrong. Because if you don't, we're going to put you out. Here's something you ought to think about. The parents know the truth. I think, quite frankly, they are happy, they're excited, they're elated about the miracle. But sometimes it's easier to be ignorant. And if you don't know, You don't have to deny. Sometimes you know things you don't want to know, but in knowing, you now have to stand up for the truth that you know. And what is it that you have? What is it that you possess? What is it that you cover? What is it that you protect? Above the truth of God's revelation about himself. They're they're afraid to acknowledge. And here's, here's the problem in my mind. If we're afraid to acknowledge what God himself has revealed, what in the world do you think you can acquire that has any real value to it if you you knowingly deny God and what God has revealed about himself? That's the trouble in this scenario, Javier. Jesus is revealing the Father. He's trying to show people who God is, what God is like, what he does, what he expects. And if we shut that down because of somebody else's opposition, what what do we have? What what do we really have? So the parents are in a situation where they are, I think, afraid. Afraid of what they know and maybe even afraid of what they didn't really want to know. They're afraid to acknowledge what Jesus has literally revealed in this miracle. They're afraid To openly, verbally say, I I think he's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the guy that we've been waiting on. Interesting thought. But I want you to know that these are the challenges that we face today. 
you can't afford to worry about the fact that we're in a post-Christian era. And if you don't know that, you need to hear me again. We're in a post-Christian era. And it's going to get to the place in the future where I think you and I are going to be the anomaly. You enjoy a great deal of freedom now. But there'll come a time in this world that your faith is going to cost you. It won't always be comfortable or acceptable or socially acceptable. Not always. Not always. Look with me, if you will. He simply says, he simply says they were afraid of the Jews in verse 22. For the Jews had agreed that if anyone should confess him to be Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. And for this reason, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. And so verse 24 says, for the second time they called the man who'd been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. This is that same old thing that the disciples thought back in verse 1. Who sinned, Jesus? Who sinned? Was it him or his parents? They simply decide we are going to label him as a sinner. And they are telling you about the state of their soul. They are in the place where the laser has hit them in the eye. And they are darkened and they are dizzy and they are immobilized. And they're incapable of hearing truth, understanding it, much less responding properly to it. In fact, rather than to gravitate towards him, they begin to attack him. And so they challenge the guy. Listen, give God glory. It's an interesting phrase. Give, give God the glory. It's kind of like the Old Testament experience in the town Ai when, when the Hebrews were going in, into the promised land and they're going from city to city and they're conquering the land, they're conquering the people. And the gentleman there in Ai hides some of the spoils from the city and puts it under his tent and just hides it. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to know. Nobody but God. And he's found out. And it costs him his life and that of his family. It costs the lives of so many other soldiers on their, on their side that lost their lives because of the defeat in the battle, because of his treachery. Joshua told him, listen, just, just give God glory. Tell the truth. Just, just tell the truth. So here's a guy who never went to school, didn't have a Braille institution, wasn't able to be taught to read or to comprehend things uh, visually. But here's a guy who now starts to tell you what his fundamental theology is, and I love this about him. He tells them, listen, verse 25, whether he's a sinner or not, I, I don't know. But one thing I do know, whereas I was blind, now I see. Here's something about this man. If you drop down into verse 31, he'll, he'll tell them, listen, here, here's, here's what we know. I know that God doesn't hear sinners. But if anyone is of God or is God-fearing and does his will, I know God hears. That man prayed. I got my sight. I don't care what you say. All I know is this is what happened. Here's the theology behind that man's miracle. God did for me what I couldn't do for myself and nobody else could do. Nobody in the history of humanity was born blind and got their sight back miraculously because somebody said, let there be. Nobody. Do you want to talk to me about who's a sinner? All I know is God listens to him. All I know is he heard him. Now I can see. Apparently, if you pay attention to what God reveals, you get direction. You get the help that you need. I got to get out of this. Let me get out. Here's, here's just the closing thought. Look at verse 30. The man answered and said, oh, here's an amazing thing. 
you don't know where he's from. It seems so simple to me, Ms. Deborah. Here's a culture in, in Judaism where they keep a record of every male child. They circumcise their male children within eight days after birth. They record the names of the father, the grandfather, the great-grandfather, the great-great-great-grandfather, and they can follow their lineage all the way back. They can go back to Abraham, and they follow their heritage and their history. And they tell him, I don't know where he came from. He said, that's an amazing thing. You know, when you, when you catch a lie, the lie just seems really big after it becomes known. <laughs> And people keep talking the same line. They keep spreading it. And after a while, he's, that's an amazing thing. You don't know where he came from? In this culture? In this city? You are the religious leaders, and this is a part of your job? You don't know Mary. You don't know Joseph. You don't know anybody in his family. You have no idea of his origin, and that is everything Jesus has been trying to tell him. I may have this earthly body, but I came from up above. And you want to tell me that? After a while, you kind of get the sense of the passion that we talked about in the paraphrased version. And the tension begins to rise, and the blind man is justifiably irritated because you've been interrogating me and asking me all these questions and you're supposed to represent God. Aren't you my spiritual leaders? Aren't you the guys who run the temple? Aren't you the guys who, who are over the priests? Aren't we in this religion together? Aren't we not the people of God? Are we not the people that God called out of all the world? A people to himself and you don't know. You're responsible for knowing. The Pharisees were supposed to be specialists in the knowledge of God. And they don't know. The blind man could say, I listened to him. I followed what he told me. I did exactly what he told me to do. And my life's been transformed. You guys have been doing the same thing you've been doing all along, and you are spiritually dead. Spiritually cold, unaffected, non unchanged, same habits, same rituals, dead in the water. Can't make an adjustment. Here's the path we want to follow. The Pharisees can't listen to him because they're spiritually incarcerated and here before them stands a person whose life has been completely transformed and that's their problem they have seen religious people their whole life they've seen religious institutional things their whole life but now they are confronted with someone who has been literally transformed changed and they see an example of what God is doing now that they've never seen before. What does the path of change look like? People who listen to Jesus, people who focus on what he says and what he's doing and remember what he's done, people who will obey him and walk with him, people whose lives go through that metamorphosis of change. This guy is standing there. You call him, they call him, in verse 34, it's not my text, but they call him an entirely or utterly a sinner. A gross sinner. They call him that. Blind man says, I don't care what you say about him. All I know is God listened to him. You're trying to figure out if he does things the way you want him to do it. God is listening to him. Maybe you also start going to church with him. Blind man getting tired. <laughs> Let me go. Here's the call. Follow him. Listen to him. Respond to him. 
That is a path of spiritual development and spiritual growth. You cannot fail in. You will always be successful. No matter what people are saying or what other people are doing or even forces gathered up around you, keep your eyes on Christ. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. And he can always make a way. Always make a way for you to get through. Always. Always. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. Father, I thank you today. There's an implication in the passage, dear Father, where the family is being challenged. The family unit, dear Lord, is being attacked. There's an implication, dear Father, that there's fear and worrying, fretting. The challenges are real. The opposition is real. But I'm praying today, Father, for the very same guidance, the very same help, the very same leadership, Lord, that you offered this man who was born blind. Would you seek us out, Lord, where we're at? Would you see us, dear Lord, in what we're going through? Would you help us, O oh God, by intervening? Would you, O oh God, lead us and guide us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake? Would you help us, dear Lord, to stand firm in these difficulties? Pray for families, Lord. Praying for marriages, Lord. Praying for children and their, their, their relationships with their parents, Lord. Praying, dear Lord, that these family units, whatever they are, if they are married couples, if they're single, whatever they are, Father, if they are family units, hold them tight. Hold them tight. Help them, dear Lord. Help us all. Perhaps there are families that are in the twilight years, Father, transitioning to a new season. I pray for families and individuals, Lord, that we would always be able to see and to have hope and to know there's help. And to keep our eyes on you. I thank you for those, dear Father, who've been living in the darkness their whole life. I'm praying that somebody could see something different today. I'm praying that somebody can see that there has been someone holding a veil over their eyes. Someone who shot a laser into their, their sphere of view. And that they've been walking around in circles and they've been dizzy and they've been locked out set that person free today lord help them to break free from their habits their routines those things that have them bound set the people free lord set the people free and i am trusting you to accomplish those things because only you can do it and we are listening to you we are remembering what you have said and what direction you're wanting us to go. And we're willing to, like the blind man, say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. I thank you for these things today. I'm praying for souls this morning, Lord. Souls. For the people you're calling to yourself. For the people you're wanting to build up and strengthen. Praying, dear Lord, for those who are shackled and bound and set, need to be set free. Praying for souls today, Father. Those, dear Father, who are perhaps mature spiritually and others, dear Lord, who are spiritually infant. We're praying for those souls today, Father. And I'm trusting you to do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today. God keep you.